Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus the Christ. There's a little town in Sweden by the name of Usta, Y-S-T-A-E. It's been around since the 1100s and for a long period of time never grew more than about 1,800 people. At the time that we're looking at in the 1700s, they were about 1,800, although they're about 18,000. In the summer, there are a lot of people who visit Usta because there's a St. Mary's Lutheran Church. It's not really a particularly beautiful piece of architecture. I've never been there, but I've looked at the pictures and photos. It isn't particularly beautiful. It's a stone structure that seems to uh, go nowhere, and uh, yet people come and visit it. Now, the reason they come and visit this church is that in the church there is a life-size and lifelike crucifix, a crucifix with Jesus on the cross, which is right exactly opposite of the pulpit. So if the pulpit is right here, the crucifix would be right there in the middle. And the story behind that crucifix is that in 1700, the King of Sweden visited St. Mary's Lutheran Church in Ustad. And when he was there, the preacher looked out into the congregation and he saw the King of Sweden and he decided that he was going to give, put his sermon aside and, and just pay respect to the king because he was held in such awe. And so he did that. He went on for a good half an hour about how wonderful the king of Sweden was. Not too long after the king had visited this church, there arrived this lifelike, life-size statue of Jesus on the cross. And with it was a command from the king. And the command was, place this crucifix with Jesus exactly opposite of the pulpit, so that every preacher who stands in that pulpit will know what his proper subject for the sermon is. The proper subject for the sermon is never how wonderful the king is, how terrific the president is, or what a terrific mayor we have, or what a wonderful congregation we have. Those may all be mentioned at times, but the subject of every sermon has to be Jesus Christ. Paul in the second chapter of Corinthians writes, in the first Corinthians, the second chapter, verse 2, writes that I was, I knew nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And again and again we find in Scripture the incredible importance of the crucifixion. And our text, even though it is so famous, and you see it at so many different sports functions, where it says, God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We cannot understand that verse unless we recognize that the verse is contained right in the middle of the crucifixion. Let me read it to you again, beginning with the 14th verse. You will remember when Tom read from Numbers, he was reading about the children of Israel who were grumbling about the food, and they suddenly were bitten by snakes, and then the snake was held, a snake, a bronze snake, was put on the cross so that everybody could see and everyone could believe. And in the 14th verse of John, when Jesus is talking, he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. In other words, in order to understand, we not only understand, in order to understand this passage, we not only have to go back to Numbers, but we have to recognize that Jesus himself was going to be crucified. And in the 16th verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And inherent in that text is, are the words which aren't explicitly stated, but are definitely implied is for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son to die for us so that whoever believes in Him. In other words, we have to recognize in our own lives that if we want to understand the love of God, we have to understand the crucifixion. We have to understand what God did for us in Jesus. We have to understand what happened there on Golgotha and the significance of that. And we have to understand that significance in the context 
of the resurrection. So if you want to quote this verse in the future, or if you see it on TV, or if you attend a sports function, immediately, immediately switch your thoughts, not just from some vague love, some big love, but switch your thoughts to the crucifixion, because only then do you understand that verse. Once you understand that the verse focuses on, on the crucifixion, then we can understand God so loved the world that he gave his only son. In other words, he gave his only son. It was a gift. It was not something that we earned. In the Ephesians section that was read by Tom, it talks about the fact that we cannot earn grace. Grace is a gift. Now, I don't know what you, what you would think about gifts. I like receiving gifts. But there's also a sort of, let me put it this way, there was a time when my mother, she, when she was still obviously old when she was alive, and somebody sent her a lily for Easter. And it ruined her Easter because she didn't know who had done it. She couldn't return the favor. And I think many of us, even though we say we like the gift, we are weary because we are afraid that we will be indebted to the person who gave us the gift. That we somehow or another need to return the favor. Well, there is absolutely no indication in Scripture that we have to return the favor. God loves you and He loves me. And there's absolutely nothing that you can do to increase God's love. And there's absolutely nothing that you can do to minimize, to lessen God's love for you and me. It doesn't make any difference whether we are the worst criminal or not. We are equally loved by God. Everyone is equally loved. So what we have here, we get what we have here then, is a gift to God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. He didn't just give Him to us, loan Him to us. He gave His only Son to die for us so that we might have eternal life. The Bedouins, who are the desert dwellers, in fact the word means desert dwellers in Arabic, the Bedouins had a story which struck me as I read it this week as quite appropriate for the text itself. There was a story about a young man who was involved in an altercation and a fight and the fight got carried away and he struck the man and killed him. The young man struck the young man and killed him. And he knew that in his culture an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth that he didn't have a chance that he would probably be immediately uh, convicted and sentenced to death. And so he took off and he ran. In the darkness of the night, he ran as far as he could until finally he got to the chiefs, who attended the chief of the tribe. And when he was there, and he, he, I don't know whether you knock on the door in a tent or what you do, but anyway, he got entrance into the tent, and the chief said, uh, what happened? And the young man explained that he had killed somebody. And the chief said, well, he said, come here. He said, You'll be safe in this tent. And when you get up in the morning, we'll have enough time to sort out what is going on. And so the morning came and they awakened and the accusers and pursuers were after him and they got to the tent and they went in and they said to the chief, he said, we uh, know that you have the man who killed another man and uh, we'd like you to give him up. And the chief said, I can't. He said, I gave my word that he would be safe until we determined all the facts and know that justice will truly be done. And the accuser said, well, you don't understand. He said, he killed somebody. He said, no, I know. He said, but uh, I gave my word. And then somebody else said, but the man he killed was your son. At that point, you could see the blood escaping from the man. The chief's face and his head drooped down and dropped and he was silent for well, a long time. And finally, he said, well, in that case, he said, I will adopt him as my son, and he will inherit all that I have. Where does that kind of love come from? That's in just in human form. What our Lord has done for us is exactly that. In fact, the story doesn't even capture what our Lord has done for us. 
our Lord has given His only Son to die for us, even though we were responsible for killing Him because of our sins. Even though we killed our Lord's, our God's Son, He has given, him, he has given His Son for us and has adopted us as Paul writes, has adopted us as His children. So the first thing we need to recognize is that there indeed is a crucifixion which is at the center of understanding this passage and understanding God's love. And the second thing we have to recognize is that we have a gift. We have a gift that has been given to us. And if we accept that gift, then we will have eternal life. So let me then be a little bit more explicit about what I mean by accept. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. In other words, God did not send His Son so that He could take a look at our sins and say, Man, oh man, are you bad? I would never expect a person like Hans Schirmer to get into heaven. God did not send His Son so that we would be condemned. God sent His Son so that we might be saved from Him, because whosoever believes in Him is not condemned. And then it goes on to say, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. The nuance here that is so important for us to capture is that we have a choice. The choice is that we can accept God. We can accept His gift. We can accept the fact that God, His Son died for us. Or we can reject it. If we accept it, we will not be condemned. If we do not accept it, if we reject it, we are already condemned. And what is important for us to know and, and recognize and hear again and again and again, it is not that God came here to condemn us, but by rejecting Him, we condemn ourselves. By rejecting Him, we condemn ourselves in a way that even God cannot change. Let me try to illustrate that with a case. I have the opinion here, the case that I once mentioned in one of my sermons here that I don't think I read part of the opinion, which is an opinion that was written in 1833, the United States versus Wilson. Let me give you the background. The background is that these two men, George Wilson and James Porter, were robbers. And they robbed a stagecoach that had the United States mail on it. And in the process of robbing it, they killed the driver. They were caught not too long after the events and were tried a year later on May 1st, 1830. And when they were tried, they were convicted and sentenced to death to be hanged. Several of the friends of George Wilson decided that they wanted to contact Andrew Johnson. And Andrew Johnson, the President of the United States, considered a pardon for George Wilson and in fact granted him a pardon. And when the pardon was to be delivered to George Wilson, George Wilson refused it. He said, I don't want a pardon. I want you to hang him. And people couldn't believe that. And so they decided to appeal the decision of the court, and it was appealed, to, the pardon was appealed to the United States Supreme Court. And the United States Supreme Court at that time had Chief Justice Marshall as the Chief Justice. And he was considered to be the greatest Chief Justice, not only by the people at that time, but he's, to, do, to this day, is considered probably the greatest Chief Justice this country has ever had. And so he had before him the issue, and the Supreme Court had before it the issue, as to whether a pardon would be effective even though it was rejected. And here's what he wrote. Pardon is an act of grace. Do you follow? That's exactly what we've been talking about, the act of grace that is explained by the Ephesians. A pardon is an act of grace proceeding from the power entrusted with the execution of the laws which exempts the individual on whom it is bestowed from the punishment the law infects for a crime he has committed. To paraphrase, we all live under a potential pardon because grace has made it possible for each one of us to forego the punishment that 
should have been ours, which Jesus bore on the cross. A pardon is an act of grace, proceeding from the power entrusted with the execution of the laws. And then he goes on to say, but it is certain that a man may waive the benefit of a pardon under the great seal, as where one who has such a pardon does not plead it, but takes the general issue and sort of legal leads. Let me translate it for you. That is, it's certain that a man can waive the benefit. In order to have an a pardon which is effective, you not only have to have somebody granting the pardon, but you have to have somebody accepting it. And what this text is telling us, that God so loved the world that he gave his son to die for us, in quotation marks or in parentheses, for, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but even have eternal life. But if you here sit with a pardon in your hand, but are going to reject it and not accept it, it will have no effect. And we have signed our own condemnation. So, let me ask you the simple question. What have you done with the pardon that has been given to you? 